All right, since I know that uh, we're in for a treat um, uh, of a lot of really uh, cool and insightful science, um, I, I'd like to get this started. So today is one of those uh, special days in the life of the, of the Brain Research Institute where we are uh, honoring and celebrating our own, and this time not our own faculty, but actually our own students. Uh, so you're here for the uh, Samuel Edison uh, student lectureship. And uh, before uh, the advisor of Bryce Bahar will introduce him, I just want to say like three sentences about the lectureship and Samuel Edison. Um, the lectureship, as you can see on the slide, has been going on since 1993, and it's really fun to sort of read back in the names uh, on all of those names and sort of think about how many of them you remember. And myself, I have to say, there's actually a lot of really, uh, you know, memorable uh, people on this list, and, and uh, today is no exception. Um, Samuel Edison uh, was actually the person who started the neuroscience IDP back in 1972, and then he continued to be chair until 1985. So he really was the one that started this all, that started recognizing that neuroscience was a field that needed a specific training of graduate students, that physiology was certainly a part of it, but that more was needed. And uh, it's in his legacy that this, uh, this lecture was inaugurated. Initially, when I came to UCLA, he still uh, was participating in the lecture. He was there, he was sitting in the front row, clearly pleased by, uh, by the way that the program had been going. And I think he will be very, would be very pleased uh, with today's lecture, which is given by Bryce Bahar. And I give the microphone or Zoom control over to Orkuna Keen. Uh, who will introduce him. So welcome and uh, fasten your seat belts. Indeed, thank you, Felix. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bryce Bahar. I met Bryce when I was a postdoc in Larry's lab and among all the people there, Bryce chose to do his rotation with me and I was lucky. It's a point of fact to state that his rotation project, one he came up with, was the seed of my own research program today. When he's, what he started and the work he subsequently did are foundational to an entire new scientific direction. The two, perhaps three, uh, we still have our fingers crossed, first author papers he produced during his thesis work with Larry Zipersky and myself will be classics in this field, I have no doubt. I can proudly say that I taught him how to push flies and perhaps instilled uh, in him appreciation for epoxy glue and shaving cream. But the rest is him. I'll let him do the talking now. Sit back and enjoy. This will be an intellectual and visual treat. Bryce? Thank you so much for the introduction, Felix and Arkun. Um, I'm Sharing my screen, go ahead and start the slides. And let me just uh, emphasize again, uh, my thanks for those kind words at the start of the lecture. And thank you to the Edison Selection Committee for giving me the opportunity and wonderful honor to share my work today. And thank you to everyone in the audience for tuning in today. It's my great pleasure to present my work in Larry's and Arkun's labs, where I have focused on determining the coordination and role of developmental activity during brain development. So today I'll be sharing what we've learned about developmental activity during neural circuit assembly. In the first part of the talk, I'll be introducing our discovery and characterization of developmental activity during synapse formation in the fly brain. The main takeaway in this first part will be that activity is a fundamental component of synapse development. Then in the second part of the talk, we'll explore how this activity is generated and what role it might play in brain development. I'll describe a gene that we identified that's important for this developmental activity. 
we found that this activity influences synaptogenesis and that there's a small subpopulation of neurons that is responsible for generating brain-wide activity. Each of these parts are represented with these icons that were, will sit at the top of the screen like so. And my goal for today will be that at the end of the talk, each of these abstracted icons will at least make some sense. And I do wanna say that if there are any questions, um, please speak up or um, uh, type into the chat and hopefully somebody can uh, alert me to the, those questions. I'm happy to take them as the, the talk is going on. It's more fun to make it a, a back and forth discussion. So with that said, let's get started. Very broadly, I'm interested in understanding how complex neural circuits are built during development. Neural function depends on the collective output of billions of neurons and trillions of synapses. The complexity of the brain is illustrated well by a technique called rainbow here, where we are looking at neurons of the hippocampus, each marked with an individual color, and the dense connections made by the processes above. During development, neurons must form precise circuitry that enable the processing of stimuli and control of behavior. Understanding how neurons form these specific and complex connections, especially in this crowded and complicated environment, is a central challenge in neuroscience. Generally, neural development proceeds with the following developmental timeline, including cell differentiation and axon guidance, synapse formation, and plasticity in response to environmental stimuli. However, it's been long appreciated that there's a period of developmental activity, neuronal activity independent of environmental stimulus that comes on during this phase of synaptogenesis. In vertebrate systems, developmental activity has been observed in a number of regions of the brain, but perhaps the best characterized case is that of retinal waves. And these are waves of activity that start in the retina and propagate throughout the visual system as reported here by calcium imaging of the mouse visual cortex. Retinal waves have been shown to broadly affect circuit formation at the level of eye specific segregation and the formation of retinotopy. This kind of oscillatory stimulus independent activity has been observed in many regions of the central nervous system, including the cortex, the cochlea, hippocampus, cerebellum, brainstem, and spinal cord. And these have also been observed across a variety of vertebrate model organisms. And a function for this activity has been identified in some of these regions. Very generally, the general notion is that this activity is thought to have some role in circuit maturation. And as mentioned before, at least in retinal waves, um, this activity is important for eye specific segregation and retinotopy. But a broader role for developmental activity throughout the brain has yet to be assessed. These regimes of activity have now been studied for over three decades, but major questions still remain about their role in development. Some of these questions include, how does activity develop, affect development at the level of synapses and cell types? How is developmental activity coordinated among distant brain regions? And how fundamental is activity to neural circuit assembly? How can we best ask and pursue these questions? In the, mam in the mammalian systems, the complexity of the brain and the current level of control at the cell type and synapse level have made it difficult to answer some of these questions. And it would be ideal to turn to a more genetically tractable model to gain further insight into what developmental activity does and how it is generated. The Drosophila visual system offers us the ability to study neural circuit assembly at the cell type and synapse level. So here's the fly brain and the visual system will be highlighted here on the left 
And the fly visual system is organized into optic neuropills, which are named here, retina, lamina, medulla, and lobular complex. And in these regions, processes from many neurons interact to form synapses. And we like the fly visual system a lot because of its well-characterized organization and development, control over individual cell types, and a full connectome mapped at the level of electron microscopy. For these reasons, this system would be excellent to investigate the role of activity on neural circuit assembly, if such activity existed in this system. By contrast to vertebrate systems, previous literature has suggested that the invertebrate brain developed independently of activity. So when I started in the lab, I sought to ask whether activity played a role or even existed in the development of this intricate yet genetically tractable system. So in the fly, synaptogenesis, along with most steps of adult neurodevelopment, occurs during metamorphosis or pupil formation. And the animal's immobile during this time, and it's a time period that occurs over about 100 hours. We'll refer to this developmental time in terms of hours after pupil formation, or HAPF. To observe potential activity during synaptogenesis, I expressed the genetically encoded calcium indicator GCAMP6S in all neurons using the Galfour UAS transgenic expression system. This gives us images like what we're seeing below, where on the left, we're looking at the head of a pupa. We can see fluorescence from the central nervous system and the regions of the brain are highlighted on the average intensity projection I'm showing on the left. Uh, with the central brain in the center and the uh, various regions of the optic lobe that I named earlier on either side. And the movie is going to play on the right. And we're going to be imaging just at this early phase of synaptogenesis. And what we found as the movie plays is that neural activity courses throughout the central nervous system during synaptogenesis. And it's happening in this remarkably coordinated way with global active and silent phases. Thus, we see that activity does occur during uh, synapse formation in the fly central nervous system. Note here that I'm speeding up the playback by quite a bit. So even though this, act, this uh, frequency of this activity looks quite fast, the oscillations that we're seeing here are on the order of 12 to 15 minutes per cycle. One of these active phases that, at least on my screen, is showing right now will last about six minutes, and then the rest of the cycle will be dominated by this period of quiescence. And I was really intrigued by this observation, partially because of this brain-wide coordination and partially because it seemed to contrast with the previous literature in the fly. So I was interested in characterizing this activity further. First, it would be desirable to observe this activity at a higher spatial resolution, ideally in the visual system. So fortunately, we can image the visual system using live two photon imaging. And this is done by imaging through a fat-free window in the eye of the animal. And this gives us optical access into the visual system. Here we're again expressing pan-neuronal pan GCAMP as seen in the average intensity projection on the left and the movie that will play on the right. We see uh, labeled here the optic nerve pills that I showed you earlier, and this is what they look like in vivo. And we see that indeed activity occurs in the visual system. With this higher spatial resolution, we can see that layers of the visual system are participating in different ways, suggesting that individual cell types may be active with different dynamics. And this point is something that we'll touch on later in just a few slides. <laughs> 
Next, we asked how this activity changed over time. So if we zoom in on the time period that activity occurs, we find that there are multiple stages of activity. First, we have an earlier periodic stage. And this uh, time period is characterized by cycles of stereotype frequency and dynamics. And uh, this is perhaps best visible on the, in the traces shown on the left, where we have time in hours shown along the x-axis and fluorescence intensity along the vertical axis. Here, each of the active phases and silent phases are of a predictable uh, duration. Starting around 70 hours after pupil formation and lasting until the final hours before the animal closes as an adult fly, we have this later turbulent stage. And here in the turbulent stage, this regularity is lost and we no longer have active and silent phases of predictable lengths. Next, through a series of experiments, we determined that this developmental activity is bona fide electrical activity. First, we co-expressed the red calcium indicator, RCAMP, with the genetically, volta genetically encoded voltage indicator, ArcLight. And with this approach, we found that activity is correlated with changes in membrane potential. Next, to ask if the calcium signal is accompanied by neurotransmitter release, we uh, paired RCAMP imaging with imaging of the glutamate sensor glue sniffer. And this was performed in the L1 cell, which is, cell that, which is a cell that's glutamatergic in the adult. And with this approach, we saw that activity correlated with extracellular glutamate release. Bryce, can I ask you a quick question? Are those, Please. Are those single cell recordings or that's averaged over the specific region or the entire brain? Yeah, so for both of these traces, um, what we're looking at is, is uh, average fluorescence intensity from a region of interest that's drawn along the um, array of cells. So okay. this is averaged across perhaps 20 or 25 cells. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. Please. I might have missed it, uh, but are those uh, electrical coordinated waves um, uh, also happening in uh, glial cells or is it just in the neurons? Oh, excellent question. And unfortunately, I'm not going to touch up on it um, in the slides I have prepared. I do have some slides later on. So if uh, we have time later on um, after the main part of the talk, I'm happy to go over those slides. But there is definitely a um, activity going on in glial cells. What we've shown is that in various cell types, um, uh, glial cell types, there's complementary activity that occurs. Um, for example, in astrocytes, uh, during neuronal silent phases, there's an increase in intracellular calcium levels. And then during neuronal, neuronal active phases, there's a decrease. Um, It'd be interesting so to, to see yeah. if you, let's say you disable the glial cells in some way, and then to see if these waves are still maintained in the neurons. Excellent point. Please ask uh, at the end of the talk because I, I okay. uh, do have a couple slides prepared on that point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so in addition to showing that activity um, is correlated with changes in membrane voltage, as well as neurotransmitter release, we showed that the calcium events were inhibited by tetrodotoxin or TTX application. And this suggests that the activity is carried by action potentials. Finally, with our focus on the visual system, we asked if the activity persisted in genetically blind flies. We know that photoreceptors are not light responsive until uh, the early to mid 80 hours APF. And this is more than a day after the onset of activity. And consistent with this notion, we found that activity was still present in genetically blind flies. Uh, 
So based on these experiments, we named this activity Pattern Stimulus Independent Neural Activity, or SENA. The P is silent. Next, as I promised you a few slides ago, we asked how individual neuron types participated in SENA. Leveraging genetic tools available on the fly, we targeted individual cell types to express GCAM, giving us the montage of uh, images that you're seeing here. Note that these patterns are arrays of many of the same type of neuron repeating over and over in the stereotypical columnar structure of the optic lobe. This is perhaps most evident in the cell type R8. This is a color photoreceptor similar to uh, cones in our own eyes. So it, with R8, the cell bodies live outside of the field of view here. They extend a single axon um, that elaborates as this stick-like axon terminal in the medulla. So each of these uh, stick-like axon terminals are the axon terminals of a single R8. So we see repeating um, versions of the same cell type throughout the array of cells here. And the movie will play in which we'll see activity of these neurons where each panel is a time-lapse from a different fly expressing GCAMP in a different cell type. And as the movie plays, you may notice that different cells display different activity dynamics. It's looking a little choppy on my end. I'm gonna see if I can improve the playback at all by um, turning off my video. And I'll let it play for a few cycles so that I can hope, hopefully convince you that all of the cells are active with oscillating active and silent phases, and that each of these cell types don't have identical activity dynamics within active phases. I'll let it run again for a couple um, cycles, and then we'll move on and focus on a couple representative cells. So let's now focus in on L1 and L3, which I think illustrate the diversity in activity patterns well. So here in the still image, a single L1 and a single L3 neuron are highlighted. And the same video for each of these neurons from the previous slide will play. And we'll see that when L1 is active, activity courses through the array in a wave-like pattern or a patchy pattern. And at least on my screen, I'm seeing an active phase right now. And we'll see that not all the uh, cells in the array are active at the same time. By contrast, when L3 is active, all the cells in the array are simultaneously active. And it may be a little difficult to see with the um, videos here. So let's take a closer look at the data in the next slide. So what we can do is we can plot out traces from the movie that you just saw. And it looks something like this with time along the x-axis and fluorescence intensity on, on along the y-axis. We can do that for both L1 and L3 shown here. And if we focus in on a single active phase, we can uh, plot that out here, where again, we have about six minutes here for both um, active phases shown. Here we can see that each active phase consists of multiple bouts of activity, and these bouts of activity we term sweeps. This representation doesn't quite capture the difference in synchronicity that I was trying to describe in the previous slide. So we can plot out the data in a different way. And what we're doing is uh, kind of what I was describing to Felix in a uh, previous question, where we draw a region of interest along the array of cells. But here, instead of plotting out the average um, values for within that whole array, we can plot out the data like so, where along the x-axis we have time, and then along the vertical axis we have distance along this array, and then the brightness of the color corresponds to the fluorescence intensity of the uh, calcium indicator. So each of these rows here 
represents activity of a given column over time. So if we highlight each sweep in blue, we'll notice one clear difference between L1 and L3 sweeps. While all columns appear to participate in each L3 sweep, a varying fraction of columns appears to participate in L1 sweeps. And we use the metric coordination to represent the fraction of cells that are active in a given sweep. To observe the synchronous versus wave-like activity, we can observe when cells in each sweep reach their peak intensity. And when we do so, we find that there's a rather wide range of peaking time for L1, as indicated in the orange shaded area here. By contrast, L3s tend to all reach their maximum intensity at about the same time within a sweep. And we call this spread coherence. So here are those values mapped out for L3 and L1, where the lines are average coordination and coherence values across the individual animals. And these individual animals are indicated as circles. The metrics of coordination and coherence can be used to characterize all the cell types that we looked at. And we found that each of these cell types displayed characteristic and unique activity signatures that are defined by these metrics shown here. We'll take an additional look at these quantitative analyses later, and I'll remind you of them when we return to them. So for now, just keep these ideas in the back of your mind. Overall, the takeaway point here is that these cell type specific activity signatures led us to ask whether activity dynamics and connectomics are related. To ask whether activity dynamics reflect connectivity, we turn to cells in the on and off motion pathways. And these are uh, microcircuits that detect bright to dark edges in the case of the off pathway and vice versa for the on pathway. We pick these microcircuits because their connectivities are well characterized. For an abstraction of the connectivity of these cells, we use this subway map view of the optic lobe where cells are colored as um, different colored tracks along the gray uh, background of the neuropils. So here we're looking at in blue TM3, and this is a cell that in the adult brain is presynaptic to this other cell T4, but not to this third cell T5. Again, these morphologies are abstracted, and then below on the left is what these cells like look like uh, what these cells look like in vivo. And we're able to look at activity of multiple cell types at the same time by expressing G-CAMP in TM3, represented in blue here, and R-CAMP in T4 and T5, represented in orange. And as the movie plays, we'll be able to see the activity dynamics of these cell types, but the playback rate of the video may make it difficult to differentiate activity between these different cell types. So to quantify these data, we compared activity dynamics with cross-correlation metrics. Zero lag correlation is shown here on the right with correlation along the vertical axis and the pairs of cells along the horizontal axis. Mean correlation during the periodic stage is plotted for individual animals as the circle and then the error bars represent standard deviation across time for that same animal. So as we can see, TM3 and T4, which again are synaptic pairs in the adult, have highly correlated activity relative to TM3 and T5, which are not connected in adult. And this suggests that synaptic communication, especially at this early uh, stage of development before we know what the, uh, the connectome looks like, could be related to activity dynamics. To investigate this point further, we expressed tetanus toxin in the presynaptic TM3 Tetanus toxin, or TNT, cleaves synaptobrevin and prevents presynaptic neurotransmitter release. And what we found was that expression of tetanus toxin decreased correlation between TM3 and T4, but not between TM3 and T5. And this showed us that activity dynamics reflect synaptic connectivity. 
So at this point, we've learned that activity occurs during synaptogenesis. It's globally coordinated throughout the brain. It exhibits cell type specific dynamics and these dynamics reflect neural con connectivity. And these characterizations leave many big questions, namely what mechanisms drive SENA and what is the role of SENA in synaptogenesis? Answering both or either of these questions would require a molecular handle to control or modulate SENA. And this takes us to our next section where we found said molecular handle to control SENA. To identify a molecular mechanism that drives activity, we performed a small genetic screen and found a mutant that had attenuated activity. The mutant gene is trip gamma. This is a cation channel that hasn't been previously studied in development. In the adult, it's been shown to have a role in vision and mechanosensation. So what we're going to be looking at is um, our videos of wide field epifluorescence imaging on the left, and then on the right traces that are generated from that same video will uh, be generated on the right. And what we'll be able to see as the movie plays is that compared to wild type activity above in white, mutant activity below in orange is significantly attenuated. And these data suggest that trip gamma plays a role in the generation of wild type SENA. So as we can see, the amplitude of activity in the control is at least by eye in the video here, about 50% uh, reduced in the uh, trip gamma mutant. So more traces are shown here, showing the strong suppression of activity in the trip gamma mutant. Each of these individual traces represent brain-wide activity from a single animal. In subsequent deficiency and knockdown experiments, we've shown that this phenotype is monogenic and isolated to the trip gamma locus, indicating it's, it, that it's trip gamma that's required for wild type activity. To ask whether trip gamma is sufficient for wild type SUNA, we turn to a particular isoform of trip gamma, trip gamma D. And this D isoform has been computationally predicted to act during development, but it hasn't been studied before. We restricted trip gamma D expression to only cells that express trip gamma using this tool, the trip gamma enhancer trap or trip gamma GAL4. And we found that trip gamma D expression in a null background completely rescues SENA amplitude. The expression of this rescue construct, again, is only limited to trip gamma expressing cells. And we see that by I here, uh, the amplitude of activity closely approximates that of the control in white. And these data are quantified below here. So what we're doing here is we're capturing average signal amplitude. We're binning it by hour, and we're normalizing the data to the control in white. As a result, the control uh, remains at one throughout. The mutant trace in orange consistently is giving us around a 50% attenuation in amplitude. And then the rescue trace in teal uh, closely matches the white control trace, showing that we've got a complete rescue of this phenotype. And then the shaded error bars are standard deviation. And these results show us that trip gamma D is sufficient for wild type SENA. Next, we sought to determine when in development trip gamma is needed. To do this, we controlled trip gamma expression uh, using the tool called uh, temperature sensitive GAL80. And this is a tool that allows us to turn trip gamma expression on or off by changing the environmental temperature. So when we use environmental temperature control to keep trip gamma expression on prior to the start of SENA, and then shortly before the start of activity, turning trip gamma expression off, we see that there's no significant rescue of SENA amplitude, as indicated in the magenta traces here, compared to mutant traces in uh, orange, 
and control traces in white. By contrast, when we express trip gamma specifically during the time that scene is occurring, by keeping expression off and then turning expression on right before the time scene starts, we see that there's robust improvement in amplitude similar to that of wild type activity. And this shows us that trip gamma is acting specifically during the time that scene is occurring to enact this phenotype. So at this point, we've established a role for trip gamma very broadly in developmental activity. What we asked next was how this mutation affects activity in the visual system, uh, both at the level of activity dynamics, as well as at the level of synapse development. So what we wanted to do first was ask how activity changed in the visual system in trip gamma mutants. Similar to what I had shown before, we express GCAMP in individual cell types using cell type specific GAL4 drivers. And we observed activity in both trip gamma mutant and heterozygous control animals, where the mutants here in this bottom row and the controls here in the top row. And as the movie plays, we'll see that activity is affected in, trip gamma, in the trip gamma mutant in specific ways. It's a little choppy on my end, maybe I'll close the video and it'll play better. Um, and as the movie plays, I'll take this opportunity to remind us about the metrics coordination and coherence. To do this, we will focus on the cell type L1 again. So let's focus on the L1 control up top in which we see that most of the cells are active in a given sweep. The fractions of cells that are active for sweep is the metric that we call coordination. And here L1 has a reasonably high coordination. Additionally, we see that L1 activity is wave-like during the sweep. Um, and the fraction of cells that peak simultaneously is called coherence. And due to this wave-like activity, L1 has a relatively low coherence. When we look below at the mutant activity in L1, we see that this activity looks different. Per sweep, not as many of the cells are participating, and those that are participating seem to be doing so less strongly. Thus, coordination is decreased in trip gamma mutants. Also, more noticeably, the wave-like activity of L1 is lost, and instead, cells that are active are doing so more synchronously. So coherence is increased in this cell. To summarize, at least in L1 that I've highlighted here, in the mutant, fewer cells participate, and when they do, they participate more synchronously. And we can see visualization of these metrics, coordination and coherence here for L1, where again, each of these um, uh, lines are the average between multiple individual animals as the circles. And um, again, with L1, there's a decrease in coordination between the control and the mutant and an increase in coherence. This trend holds through the majority of the cell types that we looked at. There's one exception, L5, where instead of an increase in coherence, there's a decrease in coherence. But in general, we see that coordination decreases and coherence increases. And again, this means that there are fewer cells that are participating in a given bout of activity. And when they are active, they're active more synchronously. This characteristic change in cell type dynamics is consistent with the decreased amplitude and the shorter sweeps that we see at the global level. And the changes to cell type specific activity led us to wonder whether synapse formation was affected in the visual system. To probe synapse formation, we commonly look at the presynaptic site marker Brukpilo or BRP. BRP is expressed at the presynaptic sites, for, uh, for example, at the synaptic boutons of this motor neuron shown here, with BRP puncta in magenta and the cell membrane labeled in green. The problem with staining for BRP in the central nervous system is that, as you might imagine, it's very broadly expressed throughout the brain. This is what it looks like if you um, stain very broadly for BRP. 
So quantifying individual presynaptic sites is prohibitive, prohibitively difficult with this broad labeling of DRP. To circumvent these issues, we use synaptic tagging with recombination or STAR. And this is an approach that allows us to label endogenous presynaptic sites in a cell type specific and sparse manner. Just to briefly go over how this works, STAR utilizes an altered BRP locus with recombinant target sites here, flanking a stop cassette, and downstream we have a sustainable tag and a lexate. Normally, the endogenous BRP locus will act as usual to produce BRP. However, when a recombinase is present, it will cut out the stock cassette, leading to production of a BRP um, protein with the tag covalently attached. And then in a separate translational event, the LEXA will go on to create a cell membrane label. And the result is that you're able to stain for your um, endogenous BRP sites and the whole cell will be labeled with this membrane marker. To achieve cell type specific labeling, we can use a cell type specific L4 driver, which in turn controls expression of their combinase and the rest works as described before. Using STAR, we're able to get images that look like this. We're in magenta, we have the cell membrane and in blue, we have the presynaptic sites. This is a medulla um, intrinsic cell called MI1. And this is what it looks like in a control animal. And this is what the same cell type looks like in a whole animal mutant. So with this approach, we can count the number of uh, puncta that are labeled. And when doing so, we find that in this cell, MI1, there's a decrease of about 25% of synapses in the mutant compared to the wild type. And in these box plots, each dot represents the total number of puncta in a given cell. Here we're plotting the data in a slightly different way. The box plots that we see here, or a box plot singular that we see here are from uh, the mutant distribution. And they've been normalized to the wild type complement of synapses. So that an average less than zero indicates a decrease in synapse counts. So we see the same data from MI1 and uh, the 25% decrease that we saw in the previous slide. We extended this analysis to 10 different visual system neurons that are shown here. And indeed, the majority of cell types show anywhere from a modest five to 10% uh, to nearly 40% decrease in synapse counts. An average of greater than zero indicates an increase in synapse counts. And there's one case, TM9, where there's uh, an increase. And we were excited about these results because they contrast with the previous notion that activity doesn't play a role in synapse development. So we needed additional experiments to confirm these results. To further characterize these results, we next asked whether the synaptic phenotype could be rescued by expression of trip gamma. We expressed trip gamma D in the expression domain of the uh, trip gamma enhancer trap. And this does not include TM9 and TM9. Then we assess synapse counts in both of these cells. We found that this significantly rescues the synaptic phenotype. To further investigate whether the synaptic phenotype comes from trip gamma's effect on activity, we attenuated activity in a harsher way by silencing all neurons with tetanus toxin. And this was done with temporal control using temperature sensitive gal 80. We found that in this activity deficient background, the synaptic phenotype in DM9 and TM9 phenocopied that of the trip gamma mutant. And these are remarkable results to us for three reasons. First, it shows that we're looking at a synaptic phenotype that's caused by the attenuation of activity. And it indicates that activity is instructive for uh, synaptic development. We see that the alterations in activity in the, uh, in the trip gamma mutant and the total loss of activity with tetanus toxin lead to the same sign and the same amplitude of changes to synapse counts. And this indicates that the patterns of activity are important for synapse development. Finally, it suggests that the synaptic phenotype is not cell autonomous 
What I mean by that is that TREP gamma is not required in DM9 or TM9 to produce this effect on Sims counts. This implies that activity comes from some subpopulation of neurons that express TREP gamma and have attenuated activity in the beam. And this brings us to our final section where we characterize TREP gamma neurons and their specific role in SENA. In this section, I'm going to show you results from several experiments that are vital to our understanding of how this activity is organized. So first, what we did is we asked how many neurons express strip gamma during, during development. We performed a developmental time course in which we labeled the nuclei of trip gamma expressing cells throughout pupil development and into adulthood. In the white trace, we have the total number of nuclei, in green, those in the central brain, and in magenta, those in the optic lobes. The error bars are standard, standard deviation, and the representative images below uh, show different points during this time course. What we found is that the complement of trip gamma cells increases during pupil development, but rises very sharply during the time that SENA occurs. The number peaks at about 1,000 cells per brain, or per half brain rather, for a total of about 2,000 cells per whole brain. And this number is about 2% of the total neurons, uh, number of neurons in the brain. Surprisingly, as SENA ends, this number levels back down and stabilizes during adulthood, suggesting that trip gamma neurons are either structurally or functionally a transient feature specific to SENA. Through additional staining experiments, we found the following characteristics of the trip gamma population. They're neurons, but not glia. Most of the neurotransmitter types are represented here, and many neuropeptides are represented, including the neuropeptide pigment dispersing factor, or PDF. And we'll highlight the PDF staining below. In teal, we have the trip gamma nuclei. In yellow, we have anti-PDF staining. And magenta, the uh, neuropel counter stain. PDF neurons are involved in sleep and circadian rhythms in the adults and are trip gamma positive, at least at the time of the image shown below, which is 72 hours APF. We were recently made aware of a population of PDF and trip gamma positive neurons in the trito cerebrum or PDF trineurons. And these PDF trineurons are transient. They're present in late stage pupae, but they disappear after eclosion. And this is consistent with our description of trip gamma neurons in the previous slide. And these characteristics of these neurons led us to ask what the morphology of these cells looks like. When we label a large subset of trip gamma neurons, we find that these neurons extend processes throughout the whole brain in a space filling manner. Let, remi let me remind you that we're looking at 2% of neurons that seem to be covering 100% of the brain. So this is a subset of all neurons that we're looking at, not just a broad labeling of the whole fly brain. To get a better sense of individual neuron morphologies, we needed to label these cells more sparsely. To sparsely label cells, we turned to a recently developed tool called SPARC, or sparse predictive activity through recombinase combination, competition rather. And this gave us labeling of less than 10 cells per brain which gives us images like the ones that you see here, where individual trip gamma neurons are labeled in blue and we're highlighting one in orange. The uh, predominant- Yes, please. So uh, do you know if these uh, trip gamma neurons extend their neurites later than the other cell types, the other neuron cell types? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently we don't have too many handles on these individual trip gamma neurons. Um, it may be possible to do a developmental time course of, of uh, the trip gamma gal 4 enhancer trap, but uh, that's something that, that we don't currently know. It yeah. would be really interesting to see how these processes develop over time. Because they seem to be few, but yet coordinate these activities. So I'm wondering if the other neurons are born, uh, extend their neurites first, and then these guys extend later, and somehow there is some guidance clue for them to know who to connect with whom. Excellent hypothesis. Um, <laughs> it's something that we're very interested in right now, so uh, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> 
Um, so again, the predominant morphology is the one that we see highlighted in, in orange, which as was very nicely pointed out, extend these uh, very wide field processes in multiple neuropils, both in the visual system and the central brain. Additionally, we do see some visual processing neurons labeled with this marker, including L1 here. So to observe whether these cells extending into the optic lobe were active during development, we expressed GCAMP and trip gamma neurons and performed two photon imaging. And the result looks like this, where we can see that trip gamma neurons participate in SENA both with or without the trip gamma protein. And we were interested in this uh, because at least by eye, the trip gamma neuron activity seemed to replicate that of the panneuronal population in terms of changes to SENA dynamics. Here in the mutant activity is more muted, but more synchronous. Movie may be a little difficult to show this, so let's look at some quantitative data, quantitative data. To investigate this further, we compared activity of trip gamma neurons to all neurons using two color calcium imaging. And we found that in both the wild type and mutant conditions, the activity of all neurons mirrors that of the trip gamma population. And this quantified it on the right here, where the correlation between trip gamma neurons and all other neurons is comparably high in both control and mutant backgrounds. And this can be explained by at least two possibilities. First, that trip gamma neurons are upstream of the rest of the neuronal population, and this, these neuronal activities are providing the template for activity throughout the rest of the brain. And this would be consistent with the morphology of the neurons that we saw a few slides ago. Second, trip gamma neurons could be at a parallel hierarchical level to the rest of the neurons in the brain, and their activity matches the whole brain activity as a function of receiving the same inputs. To differentiate between these hypotheses, it would be ideal to silence trip gamma cells and ask whether brain-wide activity is affected. And that's what we're doing here, where we're expressing the hyperpolarizing channel here 2.1, specifically during the time that SENA is occurring. And then we recorded activity panoronally using epifluorescence microscopy. So we're going to see videos on the left and then traces generated from the, those, those videos on the right. And here in the orange trace, we're going to see uh, activity from animals expressing Q2.1 only in trip gamma cells. And we'll compare it to wild type activity above in white and a positive control below in blue where all neurons are silenced. And what we see is that inhibiting the 2000 or so trip gamma cells of the brain is sufficient to silence SENA at a level similar to panoronal silencing. You'll notice that there's not 100% loss of activity in either the panoronal or trip gamma cases. And this is a point that I'll elaborate on in just a bit. Oops. And these data are quantified here, where we see that brain-wide activity from silencing trip gamma neurons closely tracks with brain-wide activity from panoronal silencing. And these results show us that trip gamma positive cells, representing perhaps 2% of the total number of neurons in the fly brain, are required for SENA to propagate throughout the brain. And this is consistent with a model in which trip gamma cells relay activity from some central signal or some central pattern generator out to the rest of the brain. So, so far we've shown that Silencing trip gamma cells leads to a loss of activity. And in this final experiment, we're going to be showing the converse. What happens if we activate trip gamma cells? So here we're expressing GCAMP panoronally and activating neurons with the thermogenetic tool, trip A1, which activates neurons with an increase in temperature. So in the white trace, we have a negative control. In the blue trace, uh, we're activating all neurons. And in the orange trace, we're activating trip gamma neurons during the temperature shift paradigm shown below. And what we see is that a uh, temperature shift in the negative control leads to a temperature dependent change in amplitude and frequency. More drastically, activating all neurons leads to a high plateau and small oscillations consistent with activity from both spiking and non-spiking cells. And finally, activation of trip gamma neurons leads to a continuous train of sweeps similar in amplitude to wild type seen at this temperature. So these data show us that activity of 
trip gamma neurons is sufficient to produce brain-wide sweeps during development. And these data suggest that their uh, centrally located trip gamma neurons are relaying activity from some initiating program represented by this uh, metronome here out to the rest of the brain, including the optic lobes. Our data suggests specifically that there's a central pattern generator upstream of trip gamma neurons that initiate activity. The data had shown you with panoronal silencing and the rem uh, remnant activity in that context is one evidence towards that point. Additionally, the morphology of trip gamma neurons is consistent with an idea of a central signal being relayed out to optic lobes. We can say from additional experiments that I don't have time to show today, that it's these wide field neurons that are playing a role rather than visual processing neurons like L1. Here's another representation for a working model for the circuit that produces and propagates SENA. Some CPG that we have yet to identify produces the rhythm and rate of SENA. Downstream, trip gamma neurons transmit and amplify activity, while at the same time shaping cell type specific dynamics. And finally, the rest of the neurons of the brain receive activity from trip gamma neurons, and their cell type specific dynamics are conferred by their connectivity with these upstream neurons. Moving forward from here, understanding how specific patterns of activity affect development at the structural, transcriptomic, or functional level will be, be facilitated by, handles, by having handles on specific trip gamma neurons. And of course, there are many additional questions to ask about SENA. Uh, some of these we've talked about um, in question today, including what role do glia play in SENA? And I'm happy to address any of or all of these questions um, if there is time for questions afterward. So with that, I'll conclude by summarizing. We discovered that developmental activity accompanies synaptogenesis in the fly, suggesting that activity is a fundamental feature of brain development. We observed that trip gamma is required uh, during development for wild type activity. In the absence of this cation channel, SENA is attenuated. We found that SENA influences synapse formation as, in a cell type specific fashion during development, linking developmental activity to synaptogenesis at the level of individual cells. And finally, we found that SENA depends on a couple thousand cells that express trip gamma reminiscent of a relay system that delivers activity throughout the brain. Overall, these results represent a step towards understanding the requirements for building a brain, and we hope that further study of this system will reveal how and to what extent developmental activity is an essential ingredient in the recipe for neural development. And of course, there are a lot of people to thank who are integral to this work. Thank you to mentors Larry and Raccoon for their tremendous support. Thank you to members of Larry's and Akun's labs, especially Wen, whose beautiful confocal images you've seen today. You've also seen data from June, Sasan, oh, Harpreet, and um, Mehmet from the Fry lab. Would also like to thank many collaborators and those who have generously shared reagents. This work would not have been possible without their help. And thank you to funding sources who have supported this work. And finally, thank you all for your attention today. I'm more than happy to take any questions.